Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, could you kind of uh, talk to us a little bit about the state of youth policy in Finland? Yes, uh, state of policy in Finland, but not all, only Finland. It's also, I think, uh, a question that could be not on the world scope, but uh, for example, European in a European setting. Uh, there are differences between European countries, of course. Is it better now? No? Uh, there are differences between European countries that are, are quite big between uh, north and south, east and west. But, but still, on a general scale, we can say that I think young people in European countries have a quite a good possibility to take part in different uh, 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 processes. On the other hand, um, they might not be as interested as people who are disenfranchised in, in, in other countries. Mm -hmm. All right. And Mr. Jenna, uh, you know, children and the youth are the leaders of tomorrow, and we have a responsibility to nurture them. Uh, can you speak about your work with the International Social Service in Switzerland and how you focus on the protection of children? Okay, hello, hello everybody. The International Social Service has just to share with you a nice event this year. We are celebrating our 90th anniversary. Oh, congratulations. We have been around for a while. And actually, since the beginning till today, our focus was always on children. Whatever happens in whichever case load we work, children are, are the most important component of our work. Our work is a little bit specific in terms, we act like a social network like Facebook or linked in as a professional network, but we, are not, we don't have a Facebook account or LinkedIn account. Actually, we are present in about 120 countries around the world, and the way we work is simple. One organization connects to the other, and within, within a national setup, this organization connects with many NGOs around it that provide social services, whether it's in education, whether it's in childcare, or in, in psychological support, legal support, and so on and so forth. I'll just give you briefly an outline of, of our services. Obviously, we are in the traditional social casework, individual cases. We do pre- and post-adoption care. We do international family mediation, essentially when there is a child abduction between binational families. One father or mother takes the children to another country and the other parent loses touch with the, with, the, with, the, with the child. We do a lot of advocacy in the area of uh, child care, in the area of children of deprived of, uh, of, of families or running the risk of being uh, deprived of families. And we work mainly cross-border. So our strength, having all these organizations around the world, is cross-border casework, actually. This is a nutshell what we do. I read that you are operating in six countries. Mm -hmm. All right. What are some of the challenges kind of operating around the world in implementing uh, you know, some of these youth programs and empowerment initiatives? Well, um, thank you for inviting me and, and thank you for the question. I think one challenge for youth and child empowerment is that it's always us, the middle age, who are talking for children and youth. So where are they when in these kind of occasions? So, but I try to, I try to um, speak for the children of the world. World Vision is working uh, in 100 countries around the world. World Vision Finland is part of the partnership and, uh, and um, empowerment is our business. Um, so to say, that's our end result if, if everything goes well. Um, but I think that uh, the main work still, if we think about children of the world, is to get the basic situation in order. There is no empowerment if there is no life. And, and we live in a, in a world where there are seven million children dying yearly for uh, pretendable causes every fourth second, so it's, it's quite hard to go to empowerment uh, from there if we don't solve the, the global uh, situation in, in that regard. So empowerment is a really powerful uh, word, it's really really good concept, but it's really hard to explain. So in a way, um, what I, I hope for the world is that we can get the voices of the children more loudly heard, also here where the resources lie. 
um, in, in order to get this world on a more right place. I think the ethics of the children, the youth are before we adults go and mess them. <laughs> they are quite right because uh, as a child you see things uh, probably in a, in a more simple way and the simple way is, is quite often quite a uh, good way. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, but uh, how, how, how does the World Vision Finland specifically implement its project? Is it you work with local partners or you have? Yes, we, we work. We have a World Vision network. So we mainly work with the uh, local uh, World Vision, like with World Vision Kenya or World Vision Sri Lanka. And the local uh, partners are working with the local civil society. So we always, um, when there is a local NGO, local CBO, uh, somebody on the grassroots who is already working with the community we are addressing, we work through them and, and with them. Uh, that's also sustainability. Uh, uh, when you use the local civil society and then NGOs and empower them because when World Vision leaves uh, they will stay there and they will make sure that the empowerment which has been created uh, also is sustainable. Okay. All right. Mr. Mr. Ayo, um, you know today's children uh, are growing up in a world where youth seems dis disproportionately favored and uh, disfavored I mean economically uh, what is the importance of family dynamic, safety and security for children's development and the ability to take on challenges later on in life? I mean, again, thank you for your introduction. And it, you know, again, I, I would emphasize that empowerment is, is something very difficult to implement, actually, just to take an anecdote. In many language to, languages today, including some of the most uh, most, the most used in the word like French, the word is of empowerment is still not really translated. There are some sub-translation for the word, depends on the context, politics and things like that. For me, when, when we work, with two, we, we have these two axes of work which we believe can contribute, not only to the empowerment as such, but for us, which is more important or equally important, keeping the families together. We work on the axis of information, education, and training. And the other axis is, is security and protection. And we believe, you know, let's take a practical example, when we have an unaccompanied minor coming somewhere to Lampedusa or some European country, or me, mainly people are moving south-south now, or east-east, or north-north, and things like that, the first thing is to identify the problem and then if we're dealing with an unaccompanied minor again is to giving this non-accompanied minor all the information he or she needs about his situation about his entitlement in the host country what that host country under international law or regional laws or, or, or European laws is entitled to, to have one of them actually is that the country cannot send him back or her back to to his country of origin and how he can get forms of integration in that country, how he can get, uh, how he, can get he or she can get uh, uh, to learn the language to, be, mm -hmm. to, to, to start with. And on the other hand, on the other axis, we talked about security. This person needs to be, feel secure so he can take hold of his or her life and start something new. And sometimes the security is there, and if the security is there, it's the organization that provides what we call protection, basically. This is what we, we understand by, by, by empowerment, okay. talking right. with individual cases. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mr. Red, in, in your outfits, you deal a lot more with, you know, doing the needs assessment on youth, and I mean, that's what you've been doing. Like, going into post-2015, uh, do you think there will be the need for some reforms in some of these policies for youth? Yes, I, I think we could always do better uh, when, we, when we look at the policy making and, and uh, taking on board young people, giving them voice and giving them uh, a share in, in planning. Uh, we have, uh, luckily, uh, more young people today that are educated uh, than we had before, ever. Uh, so we should trust young people uh, that they have the capacity to make informed choices. The question about having access to information, I think, is, is one of the most crucial ones. 
and the other one is the autonomy to actually have the capacity to, to make the choices. Uh, empowerment is, as I see it, very much about uh, these two basic things. If they are not fulfilled, it's very hard to, to have empowerment as, as such. Um, now, the situation is different for different, in different regions in the, of, of the world. Uh, so, so it's sometimes hard to have one concept for, for the totally different uh, uh, situations. But basically, I think it's all about that if we believe that we would, would like to make a better world we, for somebody, we should ask that somebody <laughs> what he or she wants. <laughs> and that's basically it. Mm -hmm. yeah. The word, the word uh, empowerment is really important because there are people in the world, children and, and young people in the world, who don't know the answer if you ask what you want, because that's not something that, it, that is in, in their life. They have never had the choice, they have not learned to do it, and uh, in development uh, we do many things, but uh, one thing we have learned from, for example, vocational training, um, we, with, with the Finnish government funding, we do that in the Korokotsu slums in Nairobi, and uh, one of the, the workers there said that, that if you don't get the young person's mind out of the slum, you will never get uh, him or her through the vocational training. So uh, before you can go to the place where you can get the vocational training and you can, you can have your own income and, and so forth, you need to have um, the basic empowerment that you know that you can and you can make the choice, mm -hmm. and, and you can provide for yourself. So in a way, uh, I think the empowerment, it's, it's, it's in a way, it's the start and it's the ending point. And do you kind of also agree for the fact that uh, there's this whole cliche about you know, universities pro you know, producing you know, graduates who, uh, who they, you know, the, the industry cannot employ them? Do you agree with that, with that, with that analogy? The industry. Uh, universities are producing graduates who uh, cannot be absorbed into the private sector because they don't have the requisite skills. And that is why we have a lot of young people who, who are unemployed. Well, uh, it of course depends uh, country to country. It might be a different story, but, but it's true that the, the content of the education is really important. I think in the Millennium Development Goals earlier we were talking about education as a quantity, and I hope that when we go up uh, the beyond the next uh, set we will go more for the quality and also on need basis education. It's also that that world might, might be changing in a way that uh, the jobs as we know might uh, when is, or, or at least there is not so more of that anymore, so, so we look up for self-employment and entrepreneurship, so that's probably one set of skills uh, which need to be taught to every child or young people in this world to handle money, do the budget, yeah. do projects. Yeah. Yeah. You want to add something? No, again, I just want to emphasize, like as you said, the empowerment is, a, is, is, is not a, a starting point and an ending point. I think it starts somewhere. And in many ways, it doesn't, never ends because, again, at one point of time, if we grasp that, that, that issue, the notice of empowerment, and if we become masters of it, we, we need to transfer it to other generations, other NGOs, whether we're talking about whether we talk about a new kinds of jobs on the market which necessitates new education, new forms of education in universities, or just dealing with one case of an unaccompanied minor coming to another country just looking to have another better life. I think at this time I will invite the audience uh, if you have any questions. Yep. Hello, thank you so much for the informative discussion. My name is Matthew Manning. I am from the United States. I represent an organization called Worldwide Orphanage Relief Coalition, and we bring sustainable and vocational resources to uh, impoverished children's communities, vulnerable children's communities. Um, in our four or so years of, of work and research, we've discovered that community is almost always at, um, in the beginning and the end, it's, it's almost always core and central to the success of the nurturing of children. To what extent would you guys say that um, you engage the communities with which you work um, to help, to have them help in nurturing the, the youth of those areas? Thank you. Maybe, maybe I, take that. Uh, I think you are absolutely right. The community is the, is the uh, starting point and the ending point. The 
children are part of their families and the families are part of the community. So if you don't get the community, the empowerment and the voice and income and food and water, the basics, it's really hard to believe that youth and, and children will get any benefits from there. It's, it's always like everything in, the, in development in, in all over the world. It's really complex, so you need to deal with uh, community-based. But also uh, the working methods, uh, I, I think the whole development work has uh, changed from uh, direct benefits to empowerment or community-based, rights-based approach, which is, in, in a case, empowerment process. So yes, I think you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think we clearly agree on, on that point. Um, I think there is also the perfect case for NGOs to show that they are actually, if you are looking at the community, what it's about, uh, NGOs can be one way of measuring how a community is working, is functioning. Is there room enough for in work that is done in the NGO form, or is there not? Uh, can the, the community function? That, that doesn't mean that all communities do have to have NGOs, but, but, uh, but I think that is a very uh, basic thing about uh, doing things together, uh, which has been said before today, the, the importance of human contact. Uh, which uh, is so typical for NGOs. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm adding to that, uh, um, many communities or many, many contexts are run by NGOs, if we count on NGOs or also CBOs, community-based organizations and every form, so where there is no government, the, the people will take the power and they will organize themselves. Uh, but that happens also, you don't have to go far. In Finland, I think the NGOs, uh, we are doing a lot of governmental work and a lot of work for the communities in, in, in Finland and also for the government. So uh, I think that's universal. All right. Um, okay. Hello, my name is Camilla and I'm representing Isaac in Finland. Um, I think we are focused on actually empowering and engaging youth, uh, mainly from university age and, and up. Um, but uh, what's interesting me a lot in the discussions taken up here is that it's mentioned that empowerment is difficult to implement. But don't you think maybe it is a question of giving youth the creative power of actually creating a project themselves that can actually create a social impact in their local environment at the end of the day? So, I mean, the question is, like, do you, do you have, like, opportunity for the youth to come up with their own project? I think that's the only way. I think um, what, I'm, what I was trying to say, that's, that empowerment is, uh, sometimes it's really hard to say that this, this was the impact, this was the end result, and it was caused by this and this and this. So it's also, also quite complicated. But always, always, uh, the children and the young and their voices are crucial part of that. But before you can hear, hear them and before you can make room for them, it might be a longer path before that. But yes, I, I think that there is no empowerment without the voice. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm Tech Subba from University of Eastern Finland and uh, currently I'm studying public health over there. And I want to uh, be a bit clear about that multi-sectoral approach and are you, how are you working uh, in a multi-sectoral approach uh, from your organization and is there, do you have any experiences of duplication uh, of your objective or duplication of your goal? Also, if you are working particularly for youth, how do you incorporate their parents or other, app, uh, other sectors? Because as we already uh, got some idea that youth empowerment cannot be uh, obtained by a single approach. Thank you. You want to take that, Mr. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, to, just to begin with, for the International Social Service, I'll give you just two or three indicators. Very few of our organizations, actually, to be frank and true, are called International Social Service. These are the founding fathers 90 years ago. All the others, mainly 80, 85% of our organizations can be 
any credible NGO in any country. That is one. Two, 62% of our workforce, and it's around 8,000 people, are volunteers, and that can start at the age of 15. And I think as we roll by, we, we, we do discover and learn year after year, whether at the central headquarters level, which we have the same system of all volunteers, or at the NGO national level, that the, these youth are actually not only a workforce and power for the organization, but they are a source of inspiration. And when we talk about connection with the community at, at any level, they are on the forefront of action. So again, they're there, they're part of the workforce, and I think we advance, develop, and progress with them and, and thanks to them. Thank you. For us, uh, multi sectoral approach means that our development base is, is it's community based. And in a long term development, the programs can last as long as 15 years. Uh, and in that, there are several projects. Um, what we want is that the community takes lead and they decide what is most important. In, in a rural context, it's usually first, it's, it's water and food, the basics. Uh, then we go to education, vocational training, income building. But always, when World Vision is on place, we, we want and, and we, we need to have the children rights and, and children and young people involved, their voices heard, and, and they are the focus. We, what we measure is child well-being, but around child well-being, there is the health system, there is the food security, uh, there is lots of things. But in a way, the multi-sectoral approach, it starts from the community and their needs. And then from there, we build the projects which are needed in, in that uh, uh, specific community. And I think you wanted to know if you do experience some sort of duplication in your work, right? Uh, well, we, we try not to, um, because um, also when, when, you, when you do long-term development, you have time to find out what are the capabilities and, and what is already there. And, and always we try to work through partners. So if there is a partner who can do it, uh, do the, the task we are doing better or even can do it, we will try to empower them and then give them the, the, all, all they need. And even if there is not a player, we can build one. We can, we can spend the five years organizing the community and even uh, try to get their self-help groups and, uh, and peer groups uh, uh, farmers groups, uh, peer groups for HIV positive people. So that's all, almost uh, the first five years of the program is to organizing the people and get them to do it because otherwise you can, you can get, you can overall something which is already there and that's not sustainable, that is not wise. So, so yeah, I, I hope this answered your question. Yeah, we need a microphone here, please. Uh, hi, my name is Melis. I'm here on behalf of Moniheli organization as well as Familia Club. And I would like to ask about the concept of family. The family doesn't necessarily is made up of a father, mother and a child in different cultures. It also has the grandfathers, grandmothers at the very core of the family. It's extended family is considered to be the core family. There are also families with adapted kids and there are also gay marriages. Uh, so the concept of family is very broad uh, against like or unlike how it is mentioned in the law. Uh, unfortunately, the, at the level of the law in Finland, for example, it's still very traditional concept of family. So in your actions, how do you take this into consideration while working in cooperation with family members? Thank you. Yeah, let, let me, it's a very good question. Thank you for that. Let me just take a practical example. We work heavily in institutions and orphanages, actually just aiming at giving every child in that institution uh, 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 a chance to have a family and to grow within the loving care of a family. And for us, family is a very broad thing. It's just not only adoptive parents, which are the traditional international adoption uh, adoption system. We talk about foster care, we talk about temporary placement within a family, 
But before we start all that, we do everything we can to find the next of kin. You talked about grandfather and grandmother. We, do, we go for cousins and nieces and uncles. And even in certain cultures, even in certain laws, the godfather and the godmother have a real legal, legal, uh, uh, legal say in, in, the child's, uh, in the child's future. So we go and check in that larger family before resorting to the traditional system of, of international family adoption or even national adoption. So, so this is, this is well, one example for us, the family, as you say, is, is a very large concept from the immediate family to next of kin to alternative family or even alternative child care systems. Well, we, we don't work, um, we work in a, in a places where the family as a legal entity is not so important. So in our um, language, we don't talk about family when we talk about children, we talk about caretakers. So every children should be cared and protected and there should be a caretaker who can be a grandmother or a cousin or even sometimes a sister. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. I have a, just a remark maybe. You know, we, we were in a meeting in Africa and we were talking about youth. The youth, they were present in the forum. And they told us, don't call us leaders for tomorrow. We want to be leaders for today, for now. And they said that they have a voice and they would like their voice to be heard. And they would like to be, um, to participate in any issue which is relative to their community, they need to be consulted. So they want to have a voice. Now I have a question for the Finnish people. And uh, you know, are the higher education institutions working for the, with the private sector? Because, uh, and if they do so, are they revisiting their curriculum with the, the participation of the youth? because they need to be part of it so that the training will uh, respond to the skills they need, the youth, the private sector need for now and for the future. And for them, I mean, for uh, also the whole nation. So it's really the flexibility of the universities, of the higher education institutions. Is it being done? Is it doable? I would hope it would be doable. Uh, I seriously doubt it. <laughs> um, one, one can approach it from, from so many different perspectives. One is, one is uh, a perspective of, of, um, of kind of national planning. Uh, you, you could set out that you, since we have had this demographic structure on, 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 on the inhabitants of Finland, we will probably need so and so many nurses for elderly in 2030. And then you will try to have enough education for uh, young people entering to be uh, nurses for elderly. Uh, and that is one way of doing it. Then you have to ask, uh, are there incentives uh, for young people to take that course? To, to go into that education? How is the payment levels and so on? Do they want to work with them and so on? So it's a really complicated question. Um, we can see that if we let young people kind of choose whatever, uh, um, I think we have one thing that is very important and that is motivation. I think you can always and only learn really well something if you are motivated and interested. So I think that is something that, that a system that does not look uh, closely enough on the young people and what they want will lack is the force of a motivation. Um, now that does not really answer the question how to, to, to look on, on long-term planning for society with very uncertain factors like for example immigration will we have people coming from somewhere else 
working, taking uh, up that part of, of the workforce that we need, or have we planned for that or not? So it's a very complicated uh, business of forecasting needs of education. And also, if you look at companies, if you would have asked the same question in Finland about the need for, for certain uh, professions, uh, ten years ago, people would have talked about uh, mobile phone industry and so on. They do not do that now. Now they are talking about uh, other part, gaming industry and, and so on, in, in, in kind of um, uh, new development there. Um, so, so it is a tricky question, especially in a global world where companies move very fast and, and can move their production and their research and design and so on. So, so I, think there, I think personally the answer is to li listen to students and to try to find the way uh, to give everybody a chance to study what they are motivated because I think that is what they will do best. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, was the answer? Okay. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Kwa. I'm also from Isaac in Finland. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Georg uh, about like um, I, I have a question like what can the Ministry of Education and Culture in Finland do in order to raise the awareness about like social issues in Finland among the youth and also help them to like speak their voice? And the second question is like how do you th see like the NGO? in like that kind of role that helping the youth in like building those awareness and also in like um, those social like um, project for the youth. Thank you. Well, the, the easiest way to answer the question would be that, that uh, we have a small budget. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, 50 million uh, uh, euro and um, about that we hand out in grants to, to to both municipalities and uh, NGOs, and about half is going to NGOs. Uh, so that would be one way of us, uh, answering the question. If we look on what policies we try uh, to um, foster through uh, granting uh, resources for projects, about half is going to the NGO sector. Uh, and that could be one way to answer it. And most of it is going to NGOs that are uh, run by young people uh, themselves. So that is a very important uh, part of it. Of course, not all organizations uh, get grants, and there will probably never be enough money to, to, to fill up every need, but, but that, is, that is how we work. We have a program, uh, a child and youth developmental development policy program uh, which sets out the main uh, uh, lines of action for for handing out the grants in Finland and that's revised every four years targets for youth organizations that's targets for youth organizations states uh, state uh, official uh, and and the ministries and and the public sector so it, it encompasses all Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Ebel. I'm from Africans and African European Association, AFIS-RU. Um, concerning one question that the moderator raised earlier, he asked the question about the employability of the university graduates. I'd like to say something regards that, and as regards what um, Madame Diallo said earlier. Um, I'm of the opinion that the students from different universities uh, and polytechnics as well can add more value to their studies if they could implement into their curriculum um, internship, not just to specific programs, but to all of them. That will not just enhance their studies, but to give them a view to the real world out there. It could be to go and work in NGOs on their practical placements, different ministries or just to take a look to what it's outside there because most courses some courses in schools they're only based on theories they teach them what is in the books which sometimes doesn't go with what's happening in the market 
But before they finish their studies, if they have like maybe six months or four months to work with organizations, ministries, or companies out there to see what is waiting for them after graduation, they can come back and give feedback to their teachers and their institutions to tell how their curriculum could be improved or worked upon. And the second thing I'd like to ask, that's a comment, but it's a question. The organizations working with um, youth and other target groups, when you give them, when ministries and funders give them money for projects or for events, is there a close checkup like um, to monitor that this funding are being used for direct implementations. For instance, I've heard and I've seen different organizations collecting for money for poor children in Africa or other parts of the world. And people donate their money to support them. But at the end of the day, a little fraction of these donations get to the target group. Is there a checkup after giving money and grants and all these kind of things to make sure that the money gets to where it should go? Thank you. Thank you very much. I can perhaps try to answer the question. Uh, it's twofold. Uh, if we look at, on grants that are uh, state grants given by ministries, uh, we have a system of checking how that money is used. You have to, to report back uh, on, on with your economic records and, of course, with, 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 with bank statements and so on. So that should be fine. Of course, there is always a question about uh, autonomy of the organization. Um, if we look at youth organizations, for example, uh, I think it's very important that, that they, uh, we will not uh, before uh, too closely limit the different ways to uh, perform a project. Uh, uh, what is important for us is, is uh, the end goal and how you reach how you reach it could be done through different means. So it, it's uh, one should be cautious not to be too rigorous about just accepting one uh, standard of projects uh, being broad enough to have different ways of implementing. Of course, there is a problem then that that um, we might think who look at the reports that they were not done in, in the most efficient way from our perspective, but uh, the grant taker had, had another view on it. So that is, that is one thing. The other part of the question is, is um, something that uh, the, the Ministry of Interior uh, is, is working with, uh, and that is the system of, of uh, getting um, a permission to, to, to uh, raise money. And there is also a system for that that is checked and monitored on, on raising money. But that's uh, uh, in another ministry, and I'm not uh, really expert on, on, on the, that question, but it's, it's within the police department there. Well, uh, I can guarantee you that if you give us money, none of that will go to any youth group, because we don't give any lump sums to, to some youth group who is going to plan to do something. I think in development, it's, it's usually, it's coaching, it's training, it's projects, it's something really inclusive. So uh, if you find somebody who raises funds just to give them away, uh, I think that you might want to look again. Um, so it's, it's always, I, I think this is uh, the discussion I, um, let's say, I don't like so much when we talk about how much money goes, uh, let's, let's say, for example, for Uganda. If you want to send 20 euros to Ugandan children, you can always put it on the post office and, and write Ugandan children, and 100% of that goes there, yeah, right? <laughs> but what is the impact? What will happen with that fund? It's, it's always when you have an NGO, you need to have the CEO, you need to have the administration, you need to have the financial services, you need to do fundraising and communications in order to get people know that that also costs money. But as we know, sometimes you can get a lot of empowerment with no money at all. You only talk, you listen, you make a plan. Sometimes you, you might need half a million dollars to, to make water pipes and something like that, that will make a huge difference. But you cannot measure the impact by money. 
alone, of course, that's important. But that's that's my kind of answer to you about um, other organizations than the government who are who are looking after the funds that people give to fundraisers and, and NGOs. There is also in Finland and in other countries fundraising organization NGOs who coach and, and help the NGOs be better in, in governance, doing good governance, doing good fundraising, being effective and, and good in what they do. Like in Finland, we have Vala RY, uh, Pia Tornikoskisi, and she's talking about that tomorrow. So I hope this an answers to your question. It does. <laughs> okay. What, 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 what clarification do you need? No, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a general um, perception out there that you know NGOs end up spending a lot of money on administration and communication, and actually, you know, a large percentage of the funds that are raised does not get to the people. So it is something that within the NGO community, it is kind of being discussed quite a lot. You know, so please don't take it, you know, personal. It's kind of a, a general, it's not only you who think so. Okay. Let, let Somebody just, raise yeah. the hand up there. Can we, can we get the mic to... Yeah, it's, she's been raising her hand there for far too long. Can we... <laughs> Yeah, you, you get a chance. <laughs> oh, okay, I okay. just have a very quick question. I'm Andrea, Worldwide Orphanage Relief Coalition. Um, you mentioned earlier about how um, empowerment would be the end result if all goes well, and and how that is a concept that though is very important is hard to describe. For something that's hard to describe, and with NGOs understanding more so the importance of m and &E systems and having those strengthened and systemized, how can you measure something that is difficult to describe in that way, and what are some of your key performance indicators in doing so? <laughs> well, if I would show you our company indicators, I would need the whole world. So that's, that's one kind of science. I, um, we have had people working for our organization who are doctors uh, doing uh, only empowerment studies uh, in that time. So um, it's measurable. You can always measure everything. There isn't any, any phenomenon in this world you cannot measure. But always when you measure, you need to take a couple of inputs, a couple of outputs. You cannot measure everything. So of course, sometimes it's, it's, um, it's difficult to choose what are the in inputs and, and what are the outputs. But um, it's measurable, and we do that. But sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's asking, asking children, what do you think? Has there been improvement? Your question? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Hello, my name is Jamie Bolling. I come from the European Network on Independent Living. There's a big echo in this, sorry about that. Um, I'm, we're talking about multi-sectoral approach involving all segments of society. I'm wondering, I haven't heard anything about inclusion of all groups, people with disabilities, except this morning with one of the ministers. But I'm wondering, again, on the same light of indicators and monitoring, because we do have goals for ensuring gender equality, inclusion, accessibility. And if we give the money out and let it be autonomous, but they don't include these things, how do we make sure it's included in our projects? That would be to Mr. Vred. The other one is, uh, uh, when you talked, um, your name was Joanne Neiman. You talked about not having a family perception when it came to care, and yet disabled people and family and care, that's quite a big area where you have to make sure there's not overprotection of parents and that you do have, allow disabled children to have a voice in self-determination, which I know is not always the case. So how do you work with these, the three of you? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. You want to take it up? Yes, I, I think it's very important to, be, to think about indicators and measurements. Um, we talk about efficiency, and especially when handing out grants and, and, and having, having that discussion. Do, do we get what we want out of policies? 
uh, irrespective if it's NGOs uh, uh, performing or if it's the public sector or who, who is doing the job, uh, the question is, do we get what we want? And um, we usually set up quite easy indicators, all too easy, uh, what we can get hold of. It's uh, frequencies, percentages of, of large populations, and what we lose in that process is usually the diversity of, of humankind. And, and that is one of the really big uh, uh, problems and questions we have to do. We, uh, should we measure boys and girls? I had a, a slide with boys and girls. Well, how about those do not, do, that do not feel that they have a sex that is either boy or girl? H how is about that? We have, we have a lot of different groups, uh, different minorities, and when you look closely, you do not find any one who is in the majority. We are all minorities in, in, in some way. And, and to have that picture clear for you is very important. I, I think that perhaps the only way that we can answer that question truthfully is to try to have two sets. One set of indicators where we can have these broad uh, numbers, statistical numbers, that we know are insufficient and not representing everything we want. And the other one is by using in-depth analysis, focus groups, and so on. They are not statistically uh, the right ones, but they will tell us if we have made something right or wrong according to those people. And by that we can get through to smaller groups. Uh, we try to do that also when we look at our plans and, and for example, the Child and Youth Policy Program. We, uh, we, we try to, to look at the different groups. It's always very hard to be successful in that, uh, but we try. Maybe the last question is mine. <laughs> <laughs> Where you are I think I think there is one more question. I think you asked two questions, right? And I think she was asking about care, care issues. Yeah, care issues with family. You remember? Can you repeat the question? You have to. Does it work? Yes, okay. The question on families and cares, over, there's overprotection most a lot often with families as well as not having the voices of young disabled people being heard. So I was wondering how uh, Ms. Nieben and her organization works with this. Okay, I, I can answer in, in, in two ways. One, one way is a general way. We, we do not in, in talking about categories of beneficiaries, we usually do not single out this kind of beneficiary to that kind of beneficiary, boy and girl, and so on and so forth. I'll just give you a practical example. When we talk about non-accompanied minors or asylum seekers, they have a need. A need is to establish themselves probably in another country, a need to have protection, a need to have security. So that need for us is a unified is, is a need that unifies them all. Now, looking closer at this case, though, we can find that we have people, for example, that live with disabilities, and these we call special needs. And this is where we construct support programs to address these special needs. I'll give you another example as well. I talked that we are heavily involved with institutions and orphanages that to try to secure a loving family or any alternative care option for those children. While we're working on that, we discovered in many orphanages around the world, and we have a pilot, pilot project now in five countries, that children living with disabilities in those institutions are actually put, put on a back burner for a very simple, and I would say stupid, excuse me, reason that many of the caregivers and the managers of those institutions are convinced that if you live with a disability and you are an orphan, nobody will adopt you, nobody will take you in a foster care, not even your own family, sometimes for, for, for cultural reasons and things like that. As we know, disability in many countries is considered a shame and people tend to hide the children or put them in institution. So in that respect, we constructed a specific program to address the needs of those children living with, in, with, with, uh, 
with disabilities and put them for, forward just as the others considered as normal so they can have a chance to grow in a loving and caring family. Another side of the question is how do we prioritize? I said in the beginning of our intervention that for us the child, the interest of the child is above all. So if we're talking about, if we're talking about international family mediation in, in a child abduction case, the interest of the child is to be able to have contact with both of his parents at all times. So this is our objective. If in a case we know that one of the parents have had signs of abuse or physical evidence and things like that, again, the, the objective will not be to put him or her in touch of that abusive parent, but probably give him much more security, much more protection with the other member of the family or, or other next of kin. So actually, it's, it, these are dynamic situations and we adapt as, as, as we see more and more cases. Okay. <laughs> you know, when you are giving grants, how much money will you accept to go into administration? How much will you accept for the program? That's, I think this is the, a very important question for us. You know, when I used to be a, in UNESCO and we had money at that time, when we gave <laughs> grants, <laughs> well, anyway, 30% <laughs> was the maximum for administration. And 70% had to go to for programs so that the people will benefit from it. So that's my, my question is how much will you accept for administration versus the program? It's a very hard, it's a very hard question to answer because uh, then you need to know exactly what you mean by administration. Uh, uh, but, but let me, let me uh, answer it as clearly as I can. Uh, we have, for example, youth organizations that will get an annual grant for their activities. And then we do not, as such, distinguish what they do with that money. It's for the total of their activities. If an organization like that applies for a project grant, then we are not allowing it to put in administration, perhaps 10% at the maximum because we are already paying them for their administration in the total grant. Uh, then there are organizations that do not get uh, yearly uh, grants for their oper oper uh, op operations. And in that respect, we could have uh, a bigger sum for the taking, organizing of that uh, project. For example, we would like them to have uh, uh, clear bookkeeping. We would like them to have uh, um, uh, a manager that is, is managing the project. It's not that you need to have a full-time staff, no. But you need to have some per persons, you have to have a structure. We need to know that they have a bank account, that they can do, uh, pay their payments, that they fulfill taxes and so on. And some administration is always needed. But we try to keep the, that into a minimum, and we really would like to see projects, and if we look at projects that are uh, coming from young people, young people do not put in administration. They are really, mm, in a way, amateurs of administration. So they do not uh, think about administration as costing anything. We sometimes have to tell them, well, you need to put into some, some money into administration because it's impossible for you to run this project successfully if you do not keep books on it, if you do not uh, ha have some structure to it. So uh, sometimes we have the opposite uh, problem uh, uh, with, with organizations. Uh, on a whole, it's, it's in our grants uh, a very small amount, but ex uh, the exception being those yearly grants for, for all the operations where we do not as such distinguished with, with all the things, but we are, have a lot of indi indicators on, on those grants as well. Um, for example, number of uh, days that they've been doing education, seminars, uh, uh, different kind of activities, depending on the organization. So then we, we look at that amount uh, versus the amount they put on, on salaries in, in a head office or something like that. 
out from the NGO side, and that I think that um, what keeps this healthy is competition and trans transparency. Because uh, we as NGOs, we need to compete for the, for the grants. The one who does the better work, so small administration, but still efficient, doing everything that should, and also checking that, that the funds are used in the right way. And also, uh, we need to uh, be able to tell the impact what has been made with the money, not only lists of results, but also in empowerment and in quality things. So um, I, I think the, in this world, um, I also hope that all the donors, not, not only the grant givers, but also private donors can go to internet and say, okay, this, uh, this organization, this NGO is effective. They do the impact I want to see in this world. I give my money to this NGO. Thank you very much, and uh, I think we'll bring the discussion to a close now. Thank you very much, all of you, for, for such a wonderful discussion, and thank you very much, uh, everybody. <laughs>